chapter two is a chemistry basically review. Um, I know you guys just got through chemistry and everything like that. When we use chemistry in this class, it's not gonna be in the format of like equations that you have to figure out like what's the reactants and what's the products and no math involved in it. I hate math and I'm literally terrible at math. I'm the worst at it. Um, so there's not gonna be math involved. It's all concept based chemistry that I need you guys to understand. So understanding things like proteins and how you know they work and stuff like that, that's the kind of chemistry that I need you guys to get out of it. That stuff and a number one, probably one of the most important things you can understand for this course, chemistry wise, is pH. So if you guys don't have a good concept of how pH works or what it is or anything like that, hopefully you can get brushed up on that um, and get that going pretty strong before we get into the other chapters where we're going to be talking about stuff that relies on that a little bit. So, um, but yeah, so that's the idea with chapter two, and that's what we're going to be going over today. Um, let me move this. I don't even need it, but whatever. Um, so atoms, we all know that atoms pretty much make up all matter in the universe. That's no big surprise at this point. If you've been through chemistry, this stuff is not news to you. Um, we've got atoms made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positive, neutrons neutral, electrons are negatively charged. Um, we've seen the atomic structure before. Again, we've got um, the protons and the neutrons in the middle and the electrons orbiting the outside in what we might call shells and however many, what shell you're in, it dictates how many you know electrons you can hold, basically. And then a lot of the aspect of the periodic table is organized based on that, right? Um, and the properties of those elements are based on that as well. So whatever, I'm not gonna test you on that, but you remember it. So molecule, there's a term that refers to a chemical substance that results from a combination of two or more atoms. It says two or more atoms, anything that has two or more atoms. So it could be the same atoms or it could be different ones, whatever. If it's got more than one atom, it's a molecule. But a compound, now we're ha only talking about having, you have to have at least two different elements in it now. That's what a compound is. We have different kinds of bonds involved in chemistry. This is a, another big one that I might, uh, this is definitely, a, I will say this to you guys, okay? Definitely this is on the test. Like I'll ask you like about which one's ionic or you know covalent based on the definitions, okay? Um, covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds. Those are the ones that I want you to be familiar with in this course. There are other ones like Van der Waals forces and crap like that that I don't care about. For this, It affects chemistry and probably biochemistry, but I don't care about it, so you're not going to have to learn it. So um, covalent bonds, let's start with those. These are when we're sharing electrons. So two atoms are literally just rotating their electrons between one another, sharing them. It's not always equally right? So sometimes if you have something like an oxygen that is very electronegative, it's hogging electrons to it more than like, let's say a hydrogen, which is more likely to have it stolen away from it. But at the same time, they are technically sharing those electrons. So it can be uneven sharing. Um, but that we'll come back to that in a moment, because that's what creates polarity, right? So that's an important one to be aware of. Covalent bonds, though, we're sharing electrons. Um, yeah, here, so good. Yes. So the oxygen in water, this is a water molecule, um, H2O, the oxygen is gonna be hogging the electrons provided to it that is supposedly sharing with the hydrogen. That means the hydrogens tend to have that positive charge to them because they aren't getting the electrons as much and the oxygen tends to have that negative charge. That's where polarity of compounds comes from. Um, just one you know, atom hogging the electrons more than another. And that can vary between atoms and how much they might hog and everything like that. But I'm not gonna make you guys measure that or anything. Just be aware that it is something that can happen. If we're talking about phosphate groups, which is again, something that comes a lot in uh, biochemistry as we're gonna be talking about in our uh, microbes, um, there's a lot of oxygens around it, right? It's a PO4, that's what phosphate is. And those oxygens, those four oxygens, all of them are electronegative. They all want to hog electrons. So they have this crazy negative charge to it. So when we talk about phospholipids, those phosphate groups on the phospholipids, crazy negative. And that's important because the lipids, as I'm sure you guys know, because they're like fats, not very polar, right? They're anti-water. So they're very non-polar. So what we call hydrophobic. And we're going to get into that too. But this is like the framework of everything it has to do with polarity. Is it polar or is it nonpolar? Is it hogging electrons or are they sharing equally, basically? All right. Then we have the obvious one, which is different, which is the ionic bonds. 
We talk about ionic bonds, but our concept of how ionic bonds work tends to be better explained when we separate the ions from one another. So the best example that everybody is aware of is sodium chloride. Sodium and chloride, we know it's NaCl when it's in its little compound form, but whenever we put it into water, it dissociates, right? Into Na, which is positive charge, the sodium, and the Cl, which is negative charge, it's the chlorine. So those are ions. So they have the chlorine, the reason it has that negative charge, it stole an electron away from the sodium, which is why the sodium has a positive charge. So they're not neutral anymore. So um, because of that electron that was donated to chlorine from sodium, now one is negative and the other is positive. So that's what ionic bonds are about. They're about transferring, like actual transfer um, from one atom to the other of those electrons. They're not sharing. So, um, so of course they're gonna have, because of that, because now they have charges associated with them, they're gonna have a pretty uh, effective association with water as well because of, of the polarity of the water molecule. So that makes sense. That's why they you know, dissolve pretty easily in water. So whenever we do dissolve those ionic compounds like sodium chloride into water, and they do dissociate that way, um, that's called ionization. And then we have the cations. The way I remember the difference between cations and anions, and if you can't remember, cations, the T looks like a plus sign, so that's the positive. That's what how I remember it. Um, whatever works for you, though. Anions are the negatively charged ones. Um, anything that is able to dissolve in water and release ions, we call those electrolytes. So, of course, we need these in, um, you know, our own bodies. We talk a lot about electrolytes. Let's say you go for a run. I don't know. Let's say you're going on a marathon. You're going to run in the um, run to remember or whatever, for Oklahoma City bombing. And you're running a marathon and they tell you you're supposed to keep, you, you know, keep up your electrolytes while you're running, right? Because you're sweating, you're losing salt and that, that's electrolytes. Even if I say that to you and that makes sense, we're telling you to put more into you. Why would we need, why would we need to maintain the electrolytes? Why would that be important? Uh, maintaining water inside your body. So maintaining the water inside of your body and how your cells, you know, interact with the water in your body, right? As well as maybe if we're not just talking about just directly salt, like sodium chloride, there are other electrolytes too, right? Like potassium, stuff like that, very important in how your muscles function. So when you guys get into physiology, if you haven't taken it yet, you'll learn how important protons and uh, potassium and sodium and all of these things are for signaling for your muscles to actually work. And that's why if you get low on those electrolytes, you start having muscle cramps. So they can't work properly. That makes sense. Um, and a lot of that, again, has to do with gradients between the positives and the negatives across the cells and everything like that. That's not my job to teach you. That's Dr. Shearer's job or whoever you take physiology with, but yeah. Okay, um, so ionization, again, this is just a picture depicting how they will kind of split up and interact with those water molecules. The negatively charged oxygen with like the positive sodium and the negatively charged chlorines with those positively charged hydrogen. So that's how it'll interact and get kind of split up and dissolve better. All right, now we have hydrogen bonds. So we've brought into the, our minds this concept that the hydrogens and the oxygens um, get these charges because of the hogging of the electrons. That creates polarity. Now we can have interaction of other molecules that also may be polar, um, interacting with those positive hydrogens or the uh, negatively charged oxygens or whatever it is. When you have your positively charged we say positively charged, but you know, they have that polarity, the positive polarity hydrogens in a molecule. It could be water, it could be whatever, but if they have that high, that positive aspect to them as hydrogen atoms in that compound, um, now they can't interact with anything that has a negative charge. That's basically what this is talking about. That's all a hydrogen bond is. I don't know if anybody ever complicated it more to you than that, but that's all it is. Um, <laughs> that hydrogen that has that positive aspect to it and then the negative whatever it is, they can interact with one another. It's important in proteins because when we talk about amino acids and all these different R groups, right? We, and I'll go with an amino acid in a second, but they have all these different groups that can come off of them. And those groups might have polarity or not, or you know, be able be acids or whatever they are in those groups. And that will allow them to interact with hydrogens in other amino acids, like across the way or whatever, so they can fold up and interact with each other differently. Um, or 
if they are hydrophobic, they might have the ones that are um, charged on the outside to interact with the watery environment of our bodies. And the ones that are hydrophobic, the ones that don't interact with water well, they're not charged, they're nonpolar, tend to be on the inside, right? And that makes sense. All of these things dictate the shape of the protein. So we have to maintain, like we were saying, uh, we have to maintain that balance of what has, you know, the positive charge or the negative charge, what's polar and what's not. And that stuff can be dictated by the environment that we're in. And that's where pH is going to come into play more, right? So that, that kind of is getting us into that concept of how this is all going to work. So hydrogen bonding, that's just our positive polarity, hydrogens interacting with something negative. And that bond, uh, is, it's not a permanent bond. There's no exchange of electrons there. It's just charges and forces that are uh, bringing them together. So pretty weak bonds, yeah. All right, if you guys uh, need me to tell you about reactants and products, I don't know what you're doing here. Um, everybody should have gone through chemistry. Reactants, what we start out with, products is what we end up with, yeah. Um, then look, I guess there's a lot of terms just to refresh your memories. Um, solutions, mixtures of substances. Um, solute is the thing that is dispersed in the solvent. So our solvent tends to be water in biological you know, models in natural systems. Um, and the concentration is just a measure of, you know, the amount of a uh, solute, a thing dissolved in the solvent. Um, that can be by per weight percentage or whatever. We're not really going to talk about that concentration too much, but the concept of it, I guess, is important. Because um, I'm not going to give you guys, like I said, I'm not giving you math or anything. All right. Using water as a solvent, that big a number one most important thing, the hydrogen bonds and how we can form hydrogen bonds with other molecules. So our ionic um, solvents are gonna dissolve uh, because cations are attracted to the negative pole, whatever. So we know that these things have some sort of aspect of charge to them or affinity for a charge. And that's what keeps everything dissolving in water. That's the idea. So if you don't have a charge like that and you are nonpolar, you're not gonna interact well with water molecules. You're just not, you're just gonna sit there and not interact with them. Um, so those are hydrophobic, those are water fearing. Okay, nonpolar molecules, they're going to repel water. This is exactly like with oil, you know, just cooking oil, like olive oil. That's exactly what we're talking about here. That inability to really mix and associate with the water molecules and dissolve in the water, hydrophobic. And that's going to be all of our fats and lipids tend to fall into this category, unless they have a nice charged group on them that allow them to do otherwise. Um, hydrophilic water loving. These are going to be our charge, our polar molecules, things that interact well with water typically. And then amphipathic. So that's our nice term, our fancy term for things like phospholipids. We talked about that phosphate group interacting well with the water. And then the tail, the lipid tail of it doesn't interact well with water. So it's got two aspects going on at the same time. It's amphipathic. Anytime that we talk about anything amphi, um, that's a term, I guess, a, what is the word for it? Um, I don't know, beginning of the word. I can't remember the word for that. A prefix, yes. <laughs> prefix, thank you. Um, prefix, that amphi. Uh, anytime you hear that, I want you guys to think about like, if you have a hard time understanding what the term means associated with it, think of it as being like amphibians. So you guys know frogs, they do well on the land and the water, right? So both. So anytime you hear amphi, think it does both well, okay? So it does charge and non charge or you can say hydrophilic and hydrophobic at the same time, amphipathic. We'll have a lot of amphis. Um, all right, so we're getting into the pH. It's our favorite time of the year. Um, acidic solutions and basic solutions. A lot of the pH scale is gonna be determined, pH itself is determined by hydrogen ion. So one of the quiz questions for chapter two quiz, um, if you guys haven't gotten to it, I know at least some people have taken it, but um, it asks about hydrogen ions well, to ask about pH, what it's a measure of, right? That's what it asks. But um, it, one of the choices is hydroxide ions or hydroxyl ion, same thing. But that's OH and pH, the reason it's pH and not pOH is because we're looking at the hydrogen ion, okay? So don't confuse them. If we have different concentrations of hydrogen ions, are we gonna have different concentrations of OH? Of course, because H2O, you have to have the whole thing, right? So H2O comes as H, H, O, 
that kind of work together. So that's the idea. If you have the right number of H's and OH's that pretty much equal what just water would be, right? Just the normal amount. That is when we have a neutral pH. That's all that means. When we have seven as our pH neutral, that just means that the OH's and the H's are equal where they should be. Anything outside of that, we have a shift. So that's what this is gonna to talk to us about. Um, does it show us the equation? Again, I'm not gonna ask you guys about like to draw me the equation of pH and show me how the pH um, equation works, but the concept of it might be useful. So anything below pH seven, I told you seven is neutral. Anything below pH seven um, is gonna be acid and above seven is basic. Now, if I'm telling you that pH has to deal with concentration of hydrogen ions, and I'm telling you lower number means acid, which is more hydrogen ions, in case you haven't made the connection. Why is it a lower number? Well, that's because the actual equation that accounts for it is a negative logarithmic. That's why. So um, think of it as like uh, negative. We're talking about in decimals. That basically is what I'm saying about like, 10 to the whatever power. So instead, of, if you guys had 10 to the negative one, um, that would be pH of one, FYI. That's how this works, okay? So 10 to the negative one versus 10 to the negative five, okay? That would be pH of five. So there's one is more acidic than five. We know that just because I told you that, right? But, it, so that is, but that's because 10 to the negative five is actually a lower number than 10 to the negative one, right? If you were to write it out with all the zeros. So that's what this table is showing us here. 10 to the zero, 10 to the negative one is 0.1, and that's pH of one. 10 to the negative six, pH of six, that's what that looks like. And so this puts it into perspective, I feel like, a little bit better than trying to like do the math of it. Um, this table just kind of shows you, okay, that's why the numbers, when you go up, you get 10 to the negative 14. That means point 14 after one, right? So that's what that really means. That's what we're getting at whenever we talk about these pHs, okay? Um, so higher number is more basic, lower number is more acidic. That actually means we have more hydrogen ions there. Right. Uh, da, 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 da. Just trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about this. Yeah, anytime that you have, like, let's say an acid and a base mixing together and you yield water and none of these are acid or base necessarily afterwards, then that is a neutralization reaction. Go figure. We've gotten rid of the acid and or the base. I always forget that I have that one. Oh, no, you're right, all right, all right. Does anybody have any questions about how that works, the pH stuff? If you do, of course, you can email me or whatever. Um, I know you guys have heard this stuff before and I don't need you to get too much into the details of the math of it. Like I said, I just want you to understand why the higher numbers are bases, the lower numbers are acids, and that the higher numbers are bases and the lower numbers are acids. And your neutral, seven. If you can remember that, we're probably in pretty good shape. So um, let's just give an example of a pH of things. We uh, probably know that lemon juice is acidic. Yeah, citric acid than that. So that's got pH of about 2.3. That would fall about there. There's not very many good examples of the bases, I don't feel like. But when well, I say oven cleaner, I don't know. Is that base or not? You know, see it. Apparently it is. <laughs> I don't know. Um, sodium bicarbonate, that can that does make sense. You know, they used to give this for like it's a sour stomach for acid in, in the stomach, um, like acid reflux. And you can still get um, medication with sodium bicarb in it. Or like I acid. Thought, I thought that's literally what comes in there. Yeah. So yes. So that's basically how they all all work. Is that similar concept? So those are like eight point four. That's we're just going to be higher. Um. So to help neutralize the acid and stuff. Oh, you don't want to be too crazy with it, right? Yeah. Uh. Blood tends to be slightly basic, but just barely. It's only seven point four. All right, moving on to organic compounds. That was it for pH. I hope that was enough for you. Um, organic and inorganic molecules. If it has a carbon and hydrogen backbone, organic. Just because it has one carbon in it doesn't make it organic. So carbon dioxide and like we have here, calcium carbonate, these are actually inorganic, 
there's no hydrogen along with that carbon backbone, right? So carbon hydrogen backbone. You need both. Yes, carbon is like the more, more key atom, but you do have to have both. And this is just kind of going over carbon. So we already know carbon is the building block of life. Why? Because carbon is an extremely stable molecule when it is bound properly to other molecules. And it binds well with hydrogen. Um, hydrogen and carbon, like let's say we had methane, which is CH4, those hydrogens share their electrons very equally with the carbon. So that's why there's no polarity in that molecule. In a lot of these um, just C's and H molecules, there's no oxygens, nothing electronegative to steal away the electrons. Then they tend to be, you know, neutral in charge. They're nonpolar. And they just get along, happy. Um, so that's the reason why carbon tends to be our building block. It's a great scaffolding for everything else to be built off of. It also um, handles charged molecules like oxygen well, as well. So um, it's you know, pretty forgiving atom or element, however you want to look at it. We have our functional groups here. I'm sure you guys learned about these when you were in chemistry, but just to go over them really quick, I would say the ones that I would be the most familiar with, if we're talking about amino acids, um, our amino group, that's the NH2 group for review, right? That's amino, this amine group. Um, we talk about the acid part of amino acid, that's carboxyl acid, carboxylic acid. Um, but I'd be more familiar with the fact that it's amino is NH because I feel like a lot of people forget that amino has that nitrogen in it. Um, so don't forget that it has nitrogen because that nitrogen is important, especially when we're talking about um, sources of nitrogen for microbes and stuff like that. We need nitrogen for amino acids. We also need them for our other molecules, but it is what it is. I don't care about an ester or sulfhydryl really that much. I mean, we're gonna they're going to be there, but I'm not going to really get too much into it. And then phosphate. So I'd say amino, carboxyl, phosphate, and maybe hydroxyl. I don't know. It's just an OH at the end. So then we have my, uh, macromolecules that we can build using our carbon hydrogen scaffolding that allows us to create all of these compounds that make up our life and everything in our life. The four main families of biochemicals, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, so these macromolecules are made up of little pieces stuck together. We already know that. That's called repeating subunits of monomers. A monomer is that single unit. A polymer is whenever we have a whole bunch of them stuck together. Um, yeah, so there you go. They can get pretty big. Um, we can build up things as, as large things like starch or, or whatever else like that. Um, but yeah. Uh, sorry, so let's start with the carbohydrates. These are sugars and polysaccharides. Polysaccharide, just saccharide is sugar. So we'll start with that. Um, polysaccharide, you have a bunch of sugars linked together. So starch is a bunch of sugars linked together. So that would be an example of a carbohydrate. And that shouldn't be too surprising because when I tell you that, um, you know, starch and we know potatoes are really starchy foods, yeah? And we know that that would be like a high carb food. Well, you guys should be able to link those thoughts together if you can't remember. Um, kind of work with what you know about some of these compounds, okay? So, um, yeah, so disaccharide, two of the sugars stuck together, polysaccharide, a whole bunch of them, um, usually five or more. And then the monosaccharides typically are named with something os, like glucose or dextrose or hex. Well, we have the hexose or pentose is like the general concept, like pentose being a five carbon sugar, hexose being six carbon sugars. These are the two most common types of sugars that we'll be dealing with, the hexoses and the pentoses. Glucose is a hexose. Um, ribose, like we have in ribonucleic acid, ribose is a pentose, it's a five carbon sugar. Yeah, that's a sugar, people forget. Okay. Um, yeah, sugars, I don't know what to say about it. I'm not gonna make you guys draw it or recognize it or anything like that. It, this is just a depiction on like a bunch of different levels of how you might uh, look at the structure of sugars either in their line form or in their actual ring form. I don't know. But if we were to analyze the difference between some of these, and I'm not going to make you guys, but you would be able to see like, even like some of them might have an H up here and an OH down there. And then the other one might have an OH up here and an H down there. That might be the only difference. And now suddenly they're called something else. And it's ridiculous. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of, 
That's exactly how this is going, actually. If we look over here, this is glucose. We have an H up here and an OH down here. And in this depiction, we have OH up here and H. Everything else is the exact same. That's glucose versus the lactose. I don't know what to say about it. It just seems ridiculous. I understand that they're different sugars and that they behave probably differently and with things and whatever, but like, it's just nuts. I don't know. So um, I have a degree, my bachelor's degree is in biochemistry and I still think this is ridiculous. So yeah. Anyways, we got down here an example of polysaccharide, just a whole bunch of sugars just linked up and linked up and linked up and so forth. That's kind of how, how starch works. Um, yeah, so here's a picture of starch down here. That's all these branching off going on. There's just building off one another. Whereas if you look up here, this is cellulose. That's what fiber is. Fiber um, is from the cell walls of plants. And that's how it kind of builds. You can see how that could make a pretty good scaffolding for a cell wall. So. All right, lipids and stuff like that. Yeah, anything that's not going to be soluble in water. So these are our non-polar molecules that don't interact well with our water compounds. They usually have long hydrocarbon change. So when I say hydrocarbon, that's exactly what's in it. Carbon with hydrogens on it, and usually not a whole lot else. Okay. So they tend to be hydrophobic in those long chains. They don't interact with water because they don't have polarity. Um, so start with triglycerides. These are what our body uses to store energy, basically. So there's storage lipids. Um, this includes the fats and the oils. So we have, I guess, a glycerol with fatty acids. I'm not gonna ask you about this, but that is what it's made of. Just, I would be aware that triglycerides are a lipid. I'm not gonna make you like draw the structure or anything. I'm not interested in that. Um, I would be aware that it's a lipid and the important fact about lipids is just that, right? Like that it's nonpolar. So. Triglycerides are storage. Uh, because they store all their energy in all these little bonds here. Anytime that you have a bond made in chemistry, it's essentially a way to store energy. And so sometimes whenever you break bonds, you can release energy. And that's how storage of energy works in our fats and our lipids. They just have these long chains of stuff um, holding basically energy in them. How do we get energy out of it? Guess what? You're going to learn that too. Whenever we talk about metabolism in chapter something, I don't remember what number but it's in unit two. Uh, yeah, so saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. If you guys ever read on the back of like a cereal box or something like that, nutritional value of things, it'll have fats and it'll have saturated and unsaturated fats. That's what this is talking about. Saturated means all of your carbons have hydrogens. We don't have any double bonds with anything. Everything is all just single bonds and hydrogens and carbons. Whereas unsaturated, we have double bonds in there somewhere with our carbon atoms. So those are going to hold a little bit more energy. And they also change the shape of the uh, fatty acid tails. So now we're moving on to the, our phospholipids. Um, we already said phosphate group, right? Very negative, very negatively charged head on the top of it. That's what that phosphate is going to do for us here. So it's amphipathic, right? Because we've got this tail that's all uh, hydrocarbons. So um, that's not gonna wanna interact with water. So what'll happen is in water, those charged heads, those phosphate groups, they'll stick to one another and hang out with one another, but the hydrophobic tail, they don't like the water, they'll stick together and then they can create these layers. And so you can create something called a micelle, that's what this would be, um, where you have your charges on the outside and your tails on the inside, or you can create you know, our membrane, our lipid bilayer. It's a bilayer because we have phospholipids on each side of it. The charged heads on the outside and the tails are on the inside. It makes it very difficult for things to pass through that whole setup because of the weird aspect of the charge on the outside and the hydrophobic on the inside. Um, so it's pretty protective as far as keeping things in where they should be and keeping things out where they should be. So pretty useful for creating membranes. Um, so as far as the membrane lipids go, uh, we'll have our you know, phospholipids, nonpolar tails in the middle. And then their characteristics allow them to interact with other lipids, things like cholesterols. Cholesterols work to provide stability to our cell membranes. That's what it is. Look, we think a lot about it getting clogged in our arteries. That's not what it does, all right? That's what you have too much of it floating around where it shouldn't be. Then yeah, it's gonna clog your arteries and stick together because they're hydrophobic, right? They don't do well mixing with the watery blood. 
So that makes sense. But normal function of them is to be associated within our cell membranes to give stability. That's what cholesterol does. And sterols do that in general for a lot of organisms. Um, yeah, yeah. So like er ergosterol, which is this one here, um, for fungi, it does the same thing for fungi. Yeah, ours is cholesterol. Um, we also have waxes. I mean, I'm not gonna talk too much about that. The only one that I really care about is when we talk about bacteria that cause tuberculosis and leprosy. They have a special wax in their um, cell wall that makes them stain differently with the acid fast stain, which we mentioned briefly. But um, but yeah, we're gonna get into that. When we do the acid fast stain, obviously, and in chapter four, we talk about um, you know mycolic acid. So uh, proteins, moving on to proteins. Um, well, yeah, I don't know what, what to say. They, these guys are the one things that do our jobs in our cells, essentially. So your genetic information, your genes, 99.9% .9 of them are going to code for a protein. And those proteins are what do stuff in your body and make you you and build you and do things for your body. They could be enzymes or they could be actual structural proteins. They could be a whole lot of different things. Proteins, man, they are like the bread and butter of the body. Um, as far as how it works and how it operates and how it gets things done. Super important. Probably the most important of the compounds that I would want you to be aware of as far as um, functionality goes. And because if you can't have your proteins working properly, you die. Um, so yeah, so your, your genetics are important too, of course, but they don't do the thing, right? They just code for the thing that does the thing. I always think of it as when we get into genetics, we'll talk about that, but um, think about it as like your genes, your DNA being like the book that's kept in the Smithsonian that says how to, I don't know, build a crib for a baby. I don't know what, but <laughs> it's the book that's in the Smithsonian. Okay. Has the instructions how to build something. And you would go there and you wouldn't like sit there and build the thing right next to it. Right. You'd go in there and make a copy of it and then take it out. Um, take that copy to your house and build the crib there. The crib would be the protein. That's the thing you need, you're using, right? That's the thing that does the job. <clears throat> DNA is this thing in the Smithsonian. The copy is your RNA. And yeah, so that's how that whole process would work. And that's how I kind of like to make a visual of that. Don't worry, you're going to hear so much of that. Bring an example that you're going to get sick of it. Um, but yeah. The building blocks of proteins are amino acids. Like we had said, we've got the amino group, the NH2. The acid is the carboxylic acid. So it's a CO2 basically shoved on the end of a thing. Um, but yeah, so that's where it gets those aspects to the actual amino acid. And then there's an R group on the end of those. So let's see, uh, do we have a picture? Yes, okay, so I'd like better. So we have our amino acid, so this amino here. That's our amino group, that's our NH2. Here is our CO2, basically. We have an H on here because it's an acid. So that's where a hydrogen ion would come from. So uh, this is carboxylic acid. Just remember that's acid and you're probably fine. And uh, this is our R group in the box here. So this is what makes valine, valine. So we're talking about valine or cysteine or phenylalanine or tyrosine as we go down there. Each one is different based on what's in the box. Everything else is the same. It just made me think of that movie, Seven. What's in the box? I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. Probably I'm aging myself by saying it, but what's in the box? Um, yeah, so cysteine has this sulfur group on it, for example, right? So we have 22 different amino acids. 20 of them are really like the most commonly used ones. Um, some of them we can't even make for our own body. So that's another example of um, a growth factor, right, for us anyways. Some bacteria are like that too. So that's our R group. That's what really gets that specific trait to that specific amino acid. Some of them, like you can see valine, it has carbons and hydrogens on here. There's no charged molecule on there, is it? So outside of what we see the amino acid base there, the R group has no charge. So that's a, you know, example of a hydrophobic or nonpolar R group. Some of the other ones have pretty whole, it means you've done alanine, you've got this big old ring on it, the benzene ring, that that is uh, very much just carbons and hydrogens, very much nonpolar as well. So when we get to some of these, like tyrosine, it has an OH group. It's that phenylalanine slap on an OH group, but that has a charge on it. Now suddenly we can interact with our molecules better. 
So that's where all these differences come from and why they're important and why we have to think about things. The sulfur group on cysteines, by the way, can make uh, actual covalent bonds across the way. Like there could be all folded up and all folded up a sulfur group and then fold it up and then another one and they meet each other when it unfolds and then they can make create actual covalent bonds across the way with one another. So our disulfide bonds, it's actually pretty important for creating structure of, of like curly hair and stuff like that. But there's a lot of other things too. Don't make, like think it's just cosmetic or something. But yeah, cool stuff. Um, all those like 20 main amino acids that do all the work for our cells, making us different, making me look different from you and everything like that. So um, a peptide, we have a short chain of amino acids, a polypeptide, we have a whole bunch of like over 20. I'm not gonna make you tell me what number, but as long as you know what I mean by polypeptide later on, that's what I need you to understand. Breaking down protein structure, primary, secondary, um, tertiary and quaternary, there's four levels. By the way, we're going to get into four of them. Primary, that is just the amino acids. So valine, phenylalanine, tyrosine linked to each other in a long, long chain, whatever. That's your primary structure. That's all it will tell you about it is that amino acid sequence. The secondary structure of a protein, that's whenever those R groups that were sticking out, that some of them polar, some of them not, and whatever, and they start interacting with one another to create basic structures like alpha helix, which is just a twist, and a beta pleated sheet, which is accordion pattern fold. It says that it folds uh, flat and then it turns and then flat and then it turns and flat and that's all it is. So those are pleated sheets. Um, so beta pleated sheets and alpha helices, these are our secondary structures. Those are based on those outer surface groups. Tertiary structure. Now we've got interaction between functional groups, maybe across the way. Um, we got creation of disulfide bonds, which are not that uncommon actually. Now we're creating an actual like whole structure, not just little structures within the amino acid sequence. Now the entire thing is folding up how it wants to based on how it's interacting with the guys nearby or across the way or whatever. I think it has a long, 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 long ribbon that is kind of folding up and um, some of the ribbon wants to be with this guy, some of them wants to be with the other guy and so on and so forth. So. That's how it'll fold up. All of this is dictated very, very much by hydrogen bonds. So I don't want you guys to forget about those hydrogen bonds because um, we have disulfide bonds, but those are covalent. But most of this is going to be dependent on hydrogen bonds. So if you put a protein that's supposed to be shaped a specific way into an acid versus into a base, it's going to fold completely differently, right? Because of the environment around it. So it's an important concept to hold on to as we move on through the other chapters, um, the effects that that can have on proteins. So, yeah. Okay, so tertiary structure, that's the big guy structure, okay? Now, quaternary structure, those globs can bind with other globs of polypeptide and stick together and that forms the working structure that's the quaternary structure. So one polypeptide that folds, one ribbon folded like that, this other ribbon folded like this, they come together and together they make a working functioning enzyme. That is the quaternary structure, okay? So we've got primary amino acid sequence. Secondary, we've got those basic uh, alpha helices and beta sheets dictated by the R groups. But now everything about it will start folding up even more into a big old glob. That's tertiary, and then those globs will come together for a functioning protein that's quaternary. That makes sense? All right, I hope it does. Enzymes and antibodies. Enzymes, enzymes are catalysts for chemical reactions. Uh, a catalyst is anything that helps drive a chemical reaction that isn't used up in the reaction itself. So it can be reused over and over and over again. So enzymes are just biological versions of catalysts. Um, so that has everything to do with their shape. So they have these binding sites that associate with what they're supposed to bind with um, and then change them into whatever it is, break it down to another molecule. Um, so if that shape isn't correct because of the pH is off or something like that, then the enzymes can't function anymore. So it's really important for enzymes. Their, their shape is important more than anything. Um, antibodies, now we have uh, glycoproteins. A glycoprotein, by the way, we've got protein in that word. Glyco is like sugar. So if you hear that glyco and think sugar, you are correct. It is like sugar, okay? So sugar molecules bound onto proteins. We can combine them. 
Um, they have different uh, attachment regions for bacteria, viruses, and other microorganisms. They have their own special way of folding and their special folding pattern allows them to react with very specific targets. Like um, one antibody might target you know, the tetanus toxin. The other antibody is specific enough that it knows the difference between tetanus toxin and the botulism toxin or something like that. So um, they're very, very specific. And that's why, you know, um, even with like vaccines, when we go from flu to flu in flu season, but we have to get new vaccines. It's not because your uh, immune system sucks so bad. It's because the flu, but we have so many different strains of flu coming out every year, probably more often than that, but we'll roll out with it every year when things start getting more risky as far as contracting the flu. Um, but they're new strains that you've never seen before. And even though we call it the flu, they're so different that they need their own antibodies. So that's why we have to give you guys immunizations all the time for flu. All right, that was it, yeah. Native state versus denatured. A native state of a protein is that functional three-dimensional form of a protein. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a working normal. That's a native state. That's what it's supposed to be in. Denatured proteins, we've denatured, um, disrupted that native state. So we can heat it. That'll break up all the bonds. You kind of know that heat breaks up bonds. That's probably no surprise to you guys coming having had chemistry. So we can heat something up and it breaks up a whole bunch of bonds. Whenever you incinerate something, um, you know, burn it, basically, especially if it's like an organic compound, it just releases a whole bunch of carbon dioxide and creates ash, right? That's just breaking up bonds and creating those products as a byproduct. So heat can break bonds quite effectively. Um, acid and alcohol and even bases can affect the structure of our proteins as well. Some disinfectants can interact with our proteins too. That's how some of them work, actually. Denaturing proteins of like whatever bacteria you're trying to kill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, next, moving on to the nucleic acids. We have deoxyribonucleic and ribonucleic acid. Those are our big two. As far as genetics goes, deoxyribonucleic, this is a, your heredity. This is what's in the Smithsonian, right? In your nucleus, kept in your nucleus, that's your Smithsonian. Um, and it's uh, not going to leave. The ribonucleic acid, that's where we have uh, instructions carried from the DNA out into the rest of the cell to make protein or whatever it needs to do. Um, so yeah, that's the copy that you make from the Smithsonian. Um, we have repeating nucleotide subunits. A nucleotide consists of a nitrogenous base, um, thymine, adenine, cytosine, guanine, or uracil. Uracil is RNA only, thymine is DNA. Um, if you guys have heard of the movie Gattaca, Gattaca, that's spelled literally with the letters that are in uh, DNA. So, you know, A, C, G, and T. Uh, replace the T with a U for RNA. The reason it uses the U is literally so, like, it's distinguishing purposes as well as chemical just interactions. That's the only reason. Um, but yeah, so we have the nitrogenous base, the A, T, C, or G, the pentose, which is a five carbon sugar, which obviously for ribonucleic acid is ribose and deoxyribonucleic acid is deoxyribose. <laughs> so it's in the name. And then um, a phosphate group. And that phosphate is going to give that negative charge, which helps create the shape of the double helix. Okay. There's two different kinds of these. They're called purines and pyrimidines. And it turns out I don't care which one is which. So uh, so there it is, but as long as you guys are aware of adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil, I'm not going to ask you which one's a purine or a pyrimidine because I literally don't care. I don't think it's important to name things like this. Um, okay, so we already said this. DNA has all the bases except uracil. RNA has all the bases except thymine. Nitrogen is pretty important for these as far as uh, the makeup. So we're using nitrogenous bases and how they interact with the sugar to make the structure up the nucleotide. Right, so RNA, we don't just have messenger RNA that carries a message from the DNA out to get read. We also have tRNA and ribosomal RNA. These are like the three major types. So messenger RNA, that's the copy of the gene. tRNA, that's gonna be transporting those proteins that we said make you know amino acids associated with the protein that you're trying to make and then help link them together. And then the RNA is a component of the ribosome that's the machinery doing all of that. I'm not gonna make you guys get into the details of that now because that's in the genetics chapter. But again, this is all leading into that. When we get into the genetics 
chapter, the more you guys understand about the chemistry behind the DNA and the um, DNA, RNA, and the protein stuff, it's going to be a lot easier on you because it's probably one of the most difficult concepts you're going to learn in the course. I'm just warning you. Okay. Um, I don't know. ATP. ATP is the energy molecule of the cell. Um, adenosine triphosphate. So it has that adenine group. That's the nitrogenous base. It has this five carbon sugar, which is ribose. And then it has these three phosphates on the end of it. Um, so if it gives or, uh, smart, let's just look at it. I don't like this picture, how they have it drawn, but that it is what it is, I guess. So you see how we have these, uh, phosphates. So let's just say one, two, and three. All right. You can imagine that if you take a South pole of a magnet and put it next to another South pole magnet, they're going to push each other apart, right? Or North pole to North pole, whatever makes you happy, but they're going to push each other apart. The negatives to the negatives they push each other apart. So these phosphates, they're pushing each other apart the whole time. And they have this major, major tension trying to get rid of the other guy with a negative charge, always, even though they are covalently bonded to one another and they can't get away. So that creates a lot of energy building up in the bonds here between, especially between two and three, because there's a lot of tension going on between those guys. So if we were to release that phosphate group, number three phosphate, it also happens to release a lot of energy that the cell can use. We can pair it to other reactions in the cell. And that is the A number one reason that anything ever happens in your body is ATP, losing that phosphate group. So it's the most important thing that goes on as far as energy goes in your cell, hands down. We'll learn a bit how that happens in the metabolism chapter. It is some of the coolest stuff. Um, when I ask you guys questions like, you know, if, why do you breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide? Uh, most people don't know what really they think oh well that's you know the red cells carry the oxygen yeah but why why do red cells carry oxygen to your tissues what is it doing for your cells do you guys know yes so it's going to be the electron transport chain how many of you guys have heard of that before so so i'll tell you this we're gonna get into because there's a lot of chemistry i'm sure you know because you've probably already learned it but <laughs> it's a lot of chemistry involved in it but it is just some of the coolest stuff that you're ever going to learn and when i tell you that you when you eat food like we'll say glucose because that's our base basic sugar that we start with right you break that down into parts to get energy which is atp by the way when you're doing that you're losing you're breaking bonds and you're losing carbon dioxide your carbon dioxide that you exhale came from the food you ate the sugar that we started with, not from the oxygen you breathed in. It has nothing, didn't ever touch that oxygen. Think about that for a minute. You probably thought it came from that. So it had nothing to do with it. Um, now, you've broken apart all your food molecule, your, your glucose, and broken it into its parts and stolen the electrons off and put it into the electron transport chain, which you guys will learn soon. And now we have all these electrons that move through to make ATP, but now electrons are left over. And what we need oxygen for is to help clean up that mess. That's the watered down version of it, but that's what we need oxygen for. It's our final electron acceptor in our electron transport chain. So they're not related, the carbon dioxide. They're related in the process of making energy, but they're not related as far as like your oxygen doesn't go into your carbon dioxide. It's not related that way. Kind of cool stuff, right? And I think that um, as we learn more about that and get into that in the metabolism chapter, you guys are gonna think it's even cooler as we break it down. I think it's super cool. It's one of my favorite. Metabolism is my, like one of my favorite subjects in case you guys can't tell. It's like really cool. Super complicated, unfortunately. Um, yeah, not as bad as the genetics chapter, so don't worry. We'll, we'll force you guys through that genetics chapter and hopefully get you to that nice, cheerful metabolism chapter. Um, so this is, this is where we are. We're now done with chapter two. This is our question of the chapter. Knowing what we do about chemistry and how molecules interact with one another, why do you think ATP makes a good energy storing molecule? I basically explained it to you guys, right? That's that, the two, the phosphate groups pushing each other apart. We can break that bond and harness that energy. 